What about the, the millions, tens of millions of Republican voters who still support Donald Trump? Uh, why alienate them? I guess the question is, you know, just ignore them. Just don't take the bait and focus on your issues. He's, he's a, living in Mar-a-Lago. Well, you know, I wish we could do that, Chris, but uh, unfortunately, uh, as I've said over the course of the last several weeks, uh, former President Trump continues to be a real danger. Uh, what he's doing and what he's saying, his claims, his, his refusal, refusal to accept decisions uh, by the courts, uh, his claims continued as recently as yesterday that somehow this election was stolen. You know, what he's doing is he's, he's causing people uh, to believe that they can't count on our electoral process to uh, actually convey the will of the people. You know, we have to be a nation of laws. Uh, if, if you continue to reject, if you reject the rulings of the courts, if you work against the rulings of our courts, then you really are at war with the Constitution. And, and he is a continuing uh, danger to our system. Those millions of people that you mentioned uh, who supported the president have been misled. They've been betrayed. And uh, certainly, as we see his continued action to attack our democracy, his continued uh, refusal to accept the results of the last election, you see that ongoing danger. And I asked this about both McCarthy and, uh, and, and Elise Stefanik. Are they being complicit in what you consider the Trump lies? They are, and and I'm I'm not willing to do that. You know, I think that that there are uh, some things that have to be bigger than party, that have to be bigger than partisanship. Our oath to the Constitution is one of those. Uh, I've seen countries, I've worked in countries around the world where you don't have a peaceful transition of power. What's happening right now with uh, uh, Donald Trump and and his continued attacks on the Constitution and the rule of law is dangerous, and and we all have an obligation to stand up against that. Congresswoman, do you know anything about that, whether or not uh, Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump talked and the president tried to reach out to, in effect, get their story straight about what happened in that January 6th phone call? Uh, Leader McCarthy has uh, spoken to a number of people uh, in, in large groups and small groups since the 6th about his exchanges with the president. Uh, he's spoken publicly on the House floor about his view of the president's responsibility. Uh, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, he clearly has facts about that day, uh, that uh, an investigation into what happened, into the president's actions, uh, ought to get to the bottom of. And I think that he has uh, important information uh, that needs to be part of any investigation, whether it's the FBI, the Department of Justice, uh, or this commission that I, I hope will be set up. This is probably the point at which Kevin McCarthy wishes that he didn't hand a microphone to Liz Cheney by virtue of supporting her ouster from Republican leadership. And that's because despite the rest of the GOP, it seems that Cheney has no intention of allowing the events of January 6th to be swept under the rug. And if that means shining a spotlight on McCarthy's own involvement in the insurrection by virtue of his conversations with Trump, it looks like she has every intention of doing that. And keep in mind, there is a reason why McCarthy is suddenly being cagey about his conversations with Donald Trump on January 6th. And that's because we already know what occurred during that conversation. Remember, Republican lawmaker Jamie Herrera Butler recounted what McCarthy himself told her about what he said while speaking with Trump. Herrera Butler said, quote, when McCarthy finally reached the president on January 6th and asked him to publicly and forcefully call off the riot, the president initially repeated the falsehood that it was Antifa that had breached the Capitol. McCarthy refuted that and told the president that these were Trump supporters. That's when, according to McCarthy, the president said, well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are. And again, that's coming from a Republican. Herrera Butler stood to gain nothing by revealing this information. If anything, she had every reason not to reveal it, considering this is effectively an invitation for excommunication from her own party. But she revealed it because it happened, even though it's clear Kevin McCarthy has every intention of denying reality to protect Donald Trump. And by the way, this isn't the first time that McCarthy has done exactly that. Here he is in the immediate aftermath of the insurrection. That doesn't mean the president is free from fault. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Accept his share of responsibility, quell the brewing unrest, and ensure President-elect Biden is able to successfully begin his term. 
pretty strong words, which makes it all the more pathetic and transparent when McCarthy then comes out a few months later and says this. Well, first of all, the conference will decide, but I don't think anybody is questioning the legitimacy of the presidential election. I think that is all over with. We're sitting here with the president today. Um, so from that point of view, I don't think that's a problem. Why the sudden change of heart? Because McCarthy stands for nothing other than political opportunism. And so while it was popular to condemn Trump in the wake of the insurrection, it's now unpopular to condemn Trump given the GOP's coordinated effort to rewrite history and make him the victim instead of the perpetrator. Kevin McCarthy isn't upholding any morals or values. He is a human kite blowing any which way the wind takes him. And by the way, taking a step back here and looking at this from a strategic point of view, Leave it to the Republican Party to wage an all-out assault on Liz Cheney for her crime of acknowledging objective reality that the election wasn't stolen, thereby effectively making her a martyr and giving her the biggest microphone in the GOP. I mean, think about it. They didn't have to do this, but because the only thing that party stands for is fealty to a one-term failed president, they decided to oust Liz Cheney from leadership, meaning that her message would be amplified leaks more than if they'd just done nothing and accepted reality. I'm not saying the GOP is a strategic disaster, but yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. And yet, what's new? The GOP has already proven, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that its only strategy is kowtowing to Trump. There's no legislative agenda, there's no governing philosophies. It's Trump says jump, we say how high. The party literally didn't even have a platform at its convention. Its platform was just, yeah, whatever errant synapse fires in Donald Trump's brain and falls out of his face, that's our position. We stand for that. But sure, very serious political party. Got it. And so look, whether it's Kevin McCarthy or Elise Stefanik or any of the other rubber stamps for Donald Trump, what's clear is that the GOP is now here governing or passing legislation or trying to make the lives of their constituents better. They're here consolidating power for themselves. That is the whole point of the big lie. They know they can't win on their platform, which would suggest they had a platform in the first place. And so instead, they've just decided that they're going to restrict the rights to vote so that those who would otherwise vote them out of office just can't vote at all. When they go all in on this strategy like they have by introducing over 350 voter suppression bills around the country, that is a tacit admission that they've failed. That's them saying, we know we can't win your votes with our agenda, and so instead, we're just going to decide who gets to cast votes. Let's be honest here, we all know exactly what we'd call this if it was happening in another country. This is what a failed party looks like, and we're seeing its demise in real time. To see more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe. And for a deeper dive, check out my podcast, No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, where I discuss the week's top stories and interview major players in the world of politics, like Vice President Kamala Harris, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, Elizabeth Warren, Chuck Schumer, Katie Porter, Pete Buttigieg, Nancy Pelosi, and many more. Again, that's No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, available anywhere you listen to podcasts.